Hello, everyone. This is Tim with Online Big Blue, bringing you the best in New York Giants sports talk and entertainment. Well, today we're going to have a special show. There are people on YouTube and other YouTubers who do enjoy our company and like us. And one of them is Brooklyn, uh, excuse me, is Brooklyn Hit Squad 96. I got to make sure I get everyone's name right. Mr. Hit Squad, say hello. Hey, what's going on, guys? Thank you for having me on the show today. Well, we greatly appreciate it. Before we get started, I, we got a couple topics today. Um, I just kind of wanted to get an idea and a feeling, you know, how did you get started in the YouTube thing with the Giants? How long you've been doing it? And, uh, you know, just give, a, just give us a little history of your channel. Yeah. Uh, well, I've been a fan of the Giants since 2006. Um, it runs in my whole family. Uh, besides my aunt, she a Jets fan for some reason. Uh, <laughs> we won't talk but, about uh, her. Oh, no, no, definitely not. Um, but I've been doing YouTube for about two years. Um, I had a period um, where it was about eight months where I stopped. I just got really engulfed in work. But uh, I just, I love talking football. I love talking Giants and just being able to interact with other people around the world that have the same, you know, likes as I do and maybe even different opinions. But we can all agree that we love the same team. So you came in at 2006. So you were just before the Super Bowl season. So you, you, yes. you were on the cusp. So my question is, in the 2006 season, wasn't a great season, wasn't a bad season. I mean, what drew you to the Giants, I mean, really, you know, in that season? Because like you said, you know, in the, I like to call them the formative years, um, mm. you know, it's like, especially when I talked to my son, you know, he was an Eagle fan for like six weeks. Oh, and, my God. You know, I, I, try, I tried to disown him, but my wife said we had to keep him. But uh, <laughs> finally went, he finally went over to the right side. But what really, like I said, it, what really just – formulated you saying hey it's 2006 you know this is the guys I want to root for these are this is the team I want to follow this is the history that I want to see this is the football I want to watch yeah definitely um well I mean I always played football uh they had it you know since I was a kid uh, little league flag um but I never really like understood you know picking a team uh, I knew that my family was, you know, we're all from New York. Um, you know, they were all huge Giants fans, but I didn't understand, you know, the team itself. And just my dad breaking it down to me, and he was a huge Eli Manning fan. You know, he would be like, you know, this is the guy that's going to bring us there. We just have to be patient. This is the guy. And uh, just seeing the toughness and leadership from him, it, you know, it's crazy enough reminding me of my dad. So I was like, you know what, like, if I'm going to like any team and this is the person putting me onto this team, you know, I'm going to stick with them. Thankfully, I did. You know, I, I, I got two Super Bowls out of it. It's been rough, the, you know, the past couple of years. But you know. rough, is, rough, I think, is a nice way to put it. <laughs> nice way to put it. I, <laughs> yeah, think, I sure. think a lot of people's fathers will always, you know, people will always say my dad did. My dad was a giant fan going back to the 40s. So, I mean, there, there was no ifs, ands, or buts that I was going to be a Giant fan. And at one mm -hmm. point, we were living in Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia. So, I mean, uh, my brother went over to the Skins. And, but, you know, what? I, I, I had to be loyal to the Blue because of the same thing, because of my father. I really didn't start following them until a little, a little earlier than you did, probably about 76. Um, oh, so, little, yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I've seen the good, I've seen the bad, and I've talked about it before, the history about the, this whole 2000 era that we're in right now reminds me of the 70s but you know but we'll 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 get into that you know we'll get into that another time um but like i said i i do want to welcome your board if you have any questions for me you know please please don't hesitate to ask and we can uh, after that we can kind of get started on some topics yeah absolutely so i i always watch your videos and i i just want to know what did you do in the NFL? Like, did you work for a specific organization? Like, what's the scoop? Because you're I, very smart with how you go about things. I it, it's it's a, it's a long story, but I'll make it a short story. I worked for uh, Tampa Bay. Uh, I worked for Miami, and I also worked uh, in the AFL. I worked. The reason I got a job at Tampa Bay was I was um, I worked at Disney. And back in 2003, the Bucks uh, were at the Wide World Sports Center where they had their training camp, but they stayed at the Celebration Hotel in Celebration, Florida. And I actually worked for the telephone company as a network analyst um, in Disney. So we were in charge of the, all the network of the hotel uh, that the, you know, Tampa Bay was staying at. And one day the internet went down. And this is back in 2003 when the internet isn't like it is now. I mean, you can go get 100 megs for 39.99 now in 2003 you were paying $14,000 a month 
So for the internet to go down, people got pissed. And the Tampa Bay Buccaneers just got a new video system, which was cutting edge at the time. It allowed them to record their practices and everything else and then watch it real time via laptops off a server. So one day, it was a Sunday, the whole internet went down. And I got a call from the hotel saying, hey, you got to get out here because you know, the Bucks are pissed. So I walk in and I walk in the telco room and I'm trying to help the guys get everything fixed. And John Gruden walks in and he looks at me and goes, you. And I go, yes. He goes, what's your name? I said, I'm, I'm Tim. He goes, when are you going to fix my internet? I said, in 30 minutes, I'm going to have it fixed. So 30 minutes turned into seven hours later. And he came in that telco room like every 15 minutes and said to me, Tim, what the F? What the F? I said, I have never been cursed out by anyone so much in my life. And then we finally got everything fixed. And I went home. It was like three o'clock in the morning. I got a phone call that Monday. And it was from the Bucks saying, hey, listen, you know, Gruden wants you to come out to the hotel and just make sure the internet's always running and make sure our, our digital system is, it's a company called XOS Digital. Just make sure the system's up and running. So I was like, well, I got a job, you know? So they actually called my boss and said, no, we want him at the hotel for the next two months. So that turned into wow. me actually being a uh, consultant. It was, I was referred to as a data network consultant. My job was to make sure the system was up and running. So I literally got to sit in all the meetings and everything just, you know, and got to kind of just, watch and you know meet people and get into the coaching staff and that kind of led into a quick job for about a season and a half with Miami and then I did a whole bunch of marketing work in the AFL and it's kind of a, a secular league you know the, at the time the two of them were so I met a lot of people you know had a lot of friends still have a lot of friends that are in the league still but um, you know it, it, it was a um, it was an interesting period and I worked for the Bucks for about two seasons before I just decided, you know, this is, you know, it's, it's great and all, but, you know, the hours and everything else, you know, if you're not a head coach, you're not a player, in some positions you're not getting played, you're not getting paid well. <laughs> so I, I, I understand. And I'm sure meeting Gruden was something. He seems like a very strong, it, not seems, he is a strong personality. It was very but. funny because my, my first year there was 2003, which was Sapp's last year, Warren Sapp. And mm -hmm. it was Chris Sims' first year, it was his rookie season. And I remember walking into a meeting and Chris Sims and Warren Snapp, Sapp were walking together. And, you know, Chris said, hi. And he goes, and you are? And he said, you are? And Warren looked at him and said, you don't know him? That's Tim What the F. So I was like, <laughs> ah. And, I, and Sapp goes, you got a problem because, you know, he goes, if, he cur if Gruden curses at you that much, he must like you. <laughs> that, like, that sounds about right that sounds about right i was like oh my god so like i said it, it was fun but um like i said i i've been following foot i played football you know followed football worked in football and like i said i'm just happy that sometimes i could bring hopefully a different perspective and a little bit more insider information you know I, people always say i'm bragging and i'm cocky but you know what most of the stuff that we've projected or said has been right I mean, oh, absolutely. The, Andrew absolutely. Thomas, the Andrew Thomas thing, we, five days before, we had a scout tell us Giants aren't passing them. They would be fools to do it. And he even thought that potentially that he could go to Washington because they, they kept saying wow. he was the most pro-ready in the draft. You know, at a, and I kept seeing all the YouTube pages and say, no, we're picking this guy, we're picking this guy. And I'm the mm -hmm. only fool that came out there and said, no, you know, we're, um, you know, we're, we're, we're taking Andrew Thomas. I'm going to listen to my sources. I had a guy that works over in East Rutherford tell me, no, we're probably going to go that direction. So, I mean, it's yeah, um, like I said, hopefully, I, now. Yeah, hopefully, like I said, hopefully I bring some insight and uh, bring some perspective. And, uh, you know, like I said, I like talking to other channels, especially yours, because, you know, like I said, you have a good daily. I see a lot of your videos. You have a good daily insight. Um, I wish mm -hmm. I could do videos, you know, more often, but, you know, even when I watched yours the other day about Ingram, <laughs> and I, you know, mm -hmm. I said, Mr. Evan, like I said, I'm not, I'm, I'm not happy that he's out of the boot because when he's in the boot, he's healthy. Um, that, that made me laugh very hard. I can't even lie to you reading that. <laughs> but but uh, You're not wrong. You know, like I said, though, but that's kind of what we do. So let's get into the first topic, though, and I'm interested in this yeah. because I got blasted um, for this, uh, and that is the giant draft. Uh, it was one of my only videos where I got more dislikes than I got likes. And I even got flagged for YouTube from hate speech. Um, oh, shit. Um, oh, but we, we're, we are, we are wrecked. No, it's okay. We're not, we're, we're not a family show. Um, <laughs> but like I said, it's, um, yeah, it's, that's being rectified. So you're, I mean, I think we kind of know my thoughts on the draft. So from mm. another perspective, you know, what are you thinking from top down? 
Well, initially, um, I did want Isaiah Simmons, but as the draft got closer, you know, I I understood the importance of the offensive line. And I just seeing the last couple of years, you know, Eli having to take the sack, all the fumbles Daniel Jones had last year and the sacks that he took, you know, I just I don't I don't need my players hurt. I don't need my franchise quarterback hurt. I don't need, you know, Saquon having another injury. Um, I thought we did pretty well, to be honest with you. There was, I'll be honest, there's some picks that I'm very mm, about, you know, why did we go that route, you know, when there was better talent on the board, in my opinion. Um, I do agree with well, you, I for, think. For, for example, who, who would you say was – now, I know who I would say was picked a little too high. I mean, from mm-hmm. your perspective, who do you think that – not that we reached on, but maybe we could have got him in a later round. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, shame on you. I like the pick, but I think that we could have gotten him in the sixth round when we picked up Cam Brown. Really? I, yeah. That, I, that was just me. I, I liked it. But I figured, you know, at this point, I was really focused on just us getting an edge rusher because we, we hadn't addressed it. We picked up another slot corner, which I get. Um, you know, we, we do need uh, a player in the slot that isn't getting toasted. Well, here's the, here's the problem with that, though, and this was a, one of my perspectives, was Julian Love's position at Notre Dame was slot corner. And mm-hmm. with picking up McKinney, you know, Love is probably not going to be, and that's what I didn't understand, Love is probably not going to be in, in the safety position. He is probably going to go back to his, you know, his natural position of slot corner. And that's why when yeah. picking up Holmes, I was kind of like, you know, are are we not trusting Beal or Ballantyne or you know some of the other people? I, don't we've think they do. I really don't. I I don't think they do. And um, I remember reading an article earlier this year. If I could find it, I'll link it down in the comments. Where Pat Sherman said that he was working with players that could that they should have been practice squad players. They should have been third string, second string players. These weren't starters. Um, so I get, you know, wanted to add more competition into it, putting better talent, but I don't feel like they trust Beal. I don't feel like they trust Ballantine in there either. I think these are players that they need time to progress. Hopefully in this scheme, you know, Patrick Graham seems to be, uh, you know, a smart defensive coordinator. So hopefully, you know, we're hoping that he can use them to the best of uh, their abilities. But uh, yeah, Shane Lemieux, I, I liked the pick. Um, I just felt at that time, okay, you know, if we're going to, we already picked up the tackle two tackles, you know, why don't we focus more on the edge? Because that's really what, at at least to me, I felt we needed at that point in time um, since the center I wanted was taken off the board by Dallas. So, I mean, what did you, and I can never pronounce his name, so I'm going to try, but what did you think of taking the kid from Connecticut third in the third round? To be honest, I liked it. I I liked it. He got big arms. You know, he's, um, I think he's, he's a talent that, He's not going to be a starter day one. He's not like an Andrew Thomas where he's going to be right there on the line day one. I could see maybe 2021 season, um, you know, for him starting on the right side. But, um, no, I really like it. I think he has a high upside as well, uh, from what I'm reading at least. Well, I, I agree that he has a high upside, but everyone, you know, everyone predicted him going fourth or fifth round. And his, his biggest right. problem is he's 6'7", and he, he's a thin. He's thin. He's, he's not a – he's not a – big guy and everyone's saying that he's probably going to get pushed around you know again you know against the you know in regards to the run that his pass blocking skills are going to be ahead of his running skills at this point in time and some people are projecting 2022 uh, 2023 for for him to be a starter and what my issue was you know we've already we've had seven bad seasons out of eight or, you know, yeah. I was not yeah. happy with Gettleman taking talent that may have a tremendous upside, but also may not even be ready for another three years. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I definitely understand building for the future, but as an organization, you, you also sometimes have to build for the now. And, and, that's kind Absolutely. Of, and that's kind of where I fell on that. What did you think, though, about taking four linebackers in the last two rounds? <laughs> You know something, uh, when I released um, my thoughts on the draft, uh, I, I, can't, I didn't even review the whole entire seventh round because the more I did my research into you know, the players, the only player I really got out of it that I ended up liking was Carter Coughlin. You know, um, I know that he produced well in the Big Ten. Uh, he was, he's a fast linebacker, smart, um, you know, and I think that's what Joe Judge wants. 
um, you know, smart I plays. Think he has the biggest uh, upside out of the, out of the yeah. out of the four. Yes, I think he definitely has the biggest upside. But you know, if you break it down and you look at the NFL statistics going back to '95, it's something like 15 percent of sixth and seventh rounders make the roster their first year and contribute. Most of them end up on the practice squad. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so my thought was, and may, I'd be interested to see what you think. Is Gettleman looking to fill the practice squad or is he just looking for bodies because he does not trust his own linebackers that he drafted and that he brought in via free agency? Yeah. I mean, I think that he definitely drafted players, um, you know, for the long run for depth. Uh, I don't know why you would go for <laughs> four linebackers in the, in the seventh round. It doesn't make any sense. Well, he did, I mean, uh, he did one in the sixth and then yep. three in the third. And then oh, yeah, three, three. Yeah, he took Cam Brown six, which uh, Cam Brown was the first uh, Penn State linebacker drafted since 13. Um, I read that. Yeah, yeah, most people didn't know that. And most, and like I said, when I did my video, most people bashed me because they're like, well, you don't know anything. I'm like, well, I can read. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, I mean, you know, Cam is a uh, Cam is a good guy. I don't know. We gotta love it. Come over here. Someone's sending me a gift. Um, Cam is a good guy, but like I said, I don't see him having the speed um, to play the outside position. And he only had four and a half sacks his entire career at Penn State. Um, so I don't know what your thoughts are when we drafted Cam. Uh, to be honest with you, hold on one second. I do apologize no problem. for that. Sorry about that. No problem. Uh, with Cam Brown, uh, I do. I did read that you know he had length, he had speed, but he was undersized. Is that correct? He's undersized, and he only ran a four seven five, and he only did mm. uh, fourteen reps at the combine. You know, on the bench. Um, yeah. So, and like I said, he only in four years he's only has four and a half sacks. So I was mm-hmm. never sure when I was looking at their draft guy. Well, I shouldn't even say draft guys because the draft guys aren't the people that usually. Um, they're not the ones that usually challenge me. It's the fans, and they're like, "Oh no, Cam Brown is this, and Cam Brown is that." And I'm like, "Well, I, I, he hasn't played it down yet." Not seeing how, it. how do we know? <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I, everything's a crapshoot. It's the draft. <laughs> I mean, you can't you can't make everybody happy, you know. You know, Xavier McKinney. What do you think? I think I he, like you. I think he's a steal at 36. Mm-hmm. He um. For lucky for us, he had a bad forty time at the combine, and he didn't have a pro day, so he never improved yeah. on that. I think he would have went in the first round if he actually had a chance to improve on that forty time. Um, but do you like him alongside? Pe- I mean, playing along Peppers, a hundred percent. I think that duo is going to be really good. Um, I think you know that makes the defense more positionless because he played a lot of different positions at Alabama and excelled in those positions and. You know, I think one thing that kind of gets underlooked is that he was pretty good in coverage. Yeah, and I think that's what we need really from good the safety coverage. position. And he was he was actually yeah. awesome in coverage, and that's why I said I think I think it's you know that's why I did the video that I think you know Gettleman had you know rock star first two picks, and then and then yeah. to me you know he kind of just kind of went down the ladder a little bit and not drafting. Any, you know, like I said, Lemieux, everyone's like, well, Lemieux's going to be a center. Well, we don't know that. He never played the position. No, we don't. And the same thing with he, he didn't address the edge. So it's like, okay. So, I mean, two of the biggest concerns on our team are still – oh, and I, I know everyone's with Spencer Pulley, and, he, and I hope he does well. But like I said, we, we have – a lot of times with the Giants, we have a lot of well, – I refer to a lot of hopes. We hope we do this. We hope we do that. You know, but I would like to have some things like our secondary and say, hey, you know, with James Bradbury and everything we had, you know, that's going to be good. You know, so. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, let me get your thoughts, though, real quick, just on the coaching staff. I mean, we've had now, I guess this is the third year or what is this? This will be the third year with an entirely new coaching staff or the fourth year. Mm-hmm. I don't know. You know, but it's, and, you know, three coaching staffs in four years. You know, judge, special team coach, no experience with, you know, as a head coach. You know, Patrick Graham, you know, his defense was ranked at the bottom in Miami. You know, and then we're, and then we're talking about old, you know, old carrot top Jason Garrett. You know, <laughs> coach Clapp. What, what, what do you think in reference to Gettleman's hires and this, this 
last opportunity he's probably going to have to hire a coaching staff for the Giants if they fail. I'll be honest with you. I, the, you know, first when Joe Judge got hired, I was like, you know, who the hell is this guy? I, think I, I had no him. idea about him. Oh, absolutely. I had no idea about him. But just I felt, you know, with his press conference, uh, his introductory press conference, he knocked it out of the ballpark. It was so refreshing to hear your coach sound like that. We didn't. I feel we didn't really get that with McAdoo. We didn't get that with Shermer. You know, well, it seemed like the they had a point. So the suit fit. The suit fit. <laughs> so, I mean, that was yeah, that was to me that was bold. You have a suit that actually fits you. So. Oh, absolutely. You know, it has to be three times the size. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I like it. I really like what Joe Judge is doing. No nonsense. And you know, the coaches that he's hiring. He has a connection in some way or form with them. Uh, Not really Jason Garrett, uh, but, you know, you look at the running backs coach, you know, you look at Patrick Graham, you know, it's just little things like that. And then I remember uh, seeing a video on this that Shermer's coaches that he hired, he had no connections with them. No, you're right. Not, not, none with them whatsoever. It wasn't anything that, you know, oh, they had a history with each other, nothing. So it was just like, he was just randomly signing, you know, these coaches or players that there's, there's no connection there. And I feel like right now, genuinely, we're headed in the right direction. I feel that, you know, they're building a continuity. And he said uh, that he wants his coaches to have to feel like a family. And the fact that, you know, it seems that everybody's on the same page. Uh, I mean, towards the draft, it didn't seem like Gettleman and uh, Joe Judge were on the same page with things. I don't know if that was a smoke screen. I have no idea if it was. You never know. <laughs> you, you, you know. You but. never – and like I said, there's so much crap that goes on before the draft. I mean, it's I, – I, I've seen it firsthand where, you know, you, and a lot of times the reporters have got it wrong because a lot of times you're right, there's so much misinformation put out by the team mm-hmm. that it's it's not even – you know. And then, you get you know, like you said, you, you think, well, maybe maybe Gettleman and Judge aren't on the same page. Maybe they, Maybe there's some animosity already. And it's like, mm-hmm. no, they're probably just playing, like, you know, playing us all for a fool and going to go some totally different Absolutely. Gettleman direction. I Definitely. And, I mean, I, I do think that they are on the same page. That's why I try to – when that was happening, I was like, you know, this has to be a smoke screen. I think Dave Gettleman definitely makes himself seem that he's not this smart guy that, you know, and some of the decisions he makes can kind of back that up with Leonard Williams. Well, you know, uh, <laughs> a lot of people yeah. say Gettleman is arrogant. And and I've met him twice now. And, and of course, it's only probably, you know, four minutes in total. You know, but he seemed like a genuinely nice guy to me. He, like I said, the, the second time I talked to him, I was at the coaches club uh, on the field, and I just yelled over to him, and he came over and started talking to me. You know, and wow. I was – I was like, wow. It's like, you know, you don't really, you know, you, you don't really get that a lot of times from, you know, executive staff level, you know, but um, oh, so like I said, you know, like I said, a lot of time people think he's a little aloof and I think maybe to your point, you know, maybe that's just the way he's acting. So people don't know, you know, what the heck he's going to do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, the same can kind of be the same with Joe Judge. He wasn't even naming, you know, starters. He wasn't naming Daniel Jones. He wasn't naming Saquon Barkley. And uh, I think, at least, you know, in recent years, we're not used to that. I think the last coach that we had for sure where we felt like we were headed in some form of a direction was, was Coughlin. I didn't, feel, I didn't feel this with McAdoo. I didn't feel this with Shermer. You know, with Joe Judge, I want to run through a wall. I'll be honest with you. I mean, I will defend that man. But, but with Shermer, I, I it, couldn't. But then the question is with Joe Judge, yes, he's very rah-rah and gung-ho, and he has a young team. But I think it's proven in the NFL that almost college-like atmosphere, rah rah, only lasts maybe two years, you know. And then, yeah. then, then pros just start tuning you out. And I think that's what happened with McAdoo and Shermer, and partly happened with Coughlin, you know, that the, mm-hmm. that the veteran just kind of said, "Eh, you know, we don't need to listen to him anymore." So that that's my only concern with Judge. You know, I mean, hopefully he'll adjust his style. You know, at the great, um, you know. Great, I, great point would be with coaches like that is Greg Schiano, uh, when he coached at Rutgers and then he went over to Tampa, and he had that one good year at not even good year he had an okay year at Tampa I think they were seven and nine, you know and they were playing the Giants so the Giants were in victory formation, 
and sure, I mean, and Shiano sent his guys over the line to try to cause the fumble. And everyone killed him that that was a college play, you know, that was Bush League, you shouldn't be doing that. And then not even two years later, you know, he was fired. So I'm not saying that Joe's going to do that, but like I said, that rah-rah, you know, thing works to a point, and then you're kind of just like, you know, players are kind of like, yeah, I'm, I'm making $13.5 million a year. Do I really need to listen to this guy? You know, do I need to hear these speeches yeah. anymore? I mean, heck, Coughlin, same thing happened with Coughlin. I mean, he, everyone tuned him out. It wasn't until Strahan went up to him and said, hey, listen, you've got to adjust your style. You know, and once he adjusted his style and lightened himself up, you know, we, you know, we win two Super Bowls. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I can definitely see that argument being made. Um, I, you know, sometimes it just it, it's, it comes down to a gut feeling. I know that's, that isn't much, you know, to really work with. Gut feeling just, sometimes all you got. A hundred percent. I mean, it just seems that they have a plan um, with, you know, building from the trenches. We, we're seeing that with the offensive line, um, which is really good to see. It's, it's good to see that they have a plan that they want to, you know, put in year in, year out. You know, I feel like with some of these picks, you know, yeah, it's not for this year. It's for, you know, the coming years, which mm, it, it could be kind of throwing darts on a board and hoping you hit something, you know, especially with these players uh, that you're hoping could have that potential. Uh, but I think a lot of people also forget that a lot of these six, seventh round players, they're going to be practice squad players if they make the team. Or out of know, the league. Or death pieces. Or yeah. out of the league, yeah. So with, with all this potential and all this potential promise, mm. we like to do it all the time, bold predictions. We've done a couple videos of bold predictions for the Giants in the 2020 season. What is the hit squad's bold predictions for this year with the Giants? Man, I got two. Two? I got two. Okay. I got two. Uh, for me, it's either or, but I think they're not far out of reach. I think Daniel Jones throws minimum 30 touchdowns this year. Really? I think he throws 30 touchdowns this year, to be honest with you. I mean, if we, you know, if he threw 24 in the games that he played, I believe he missed, what was it, a game or two, you know, with the, with the high ankle sprain. Yeah, you take games. that into account. Two, yeah, two games. He takes that into account. In the he missed the games in the beginning missed, of the season. So four total games. You know, those games where he was throwing five touchdowns, you know, four touchdowns, you know, I think it's definitely possible that he can hit that ceiling. Uh, that would be my – that would be my 1A. My 1B is I have Saquon rushing for 15 touchdowns this year. That's the one I really want to leave with the most. Yeah. Wow. 15 touchdowns. Well, I laugh because we did a video and I had – Daniel Jones throwing for 30 and over 4,000, and I have Saquon mm. rushing for 2,000 yards. I could see that. I, so, could see, I could see either or, to be honest. And with I guess you. I, see, I see it both, and my, always, my concern was always the defense. You know, where are we going to be with the defense? And like I said, I think, like we talked about, I think with, you know, Patrick Graham, I think we may have we, – we may finally have a system that will work like when we had it with Spagnola. So I, it's just, hopefully this is going to take time for the talent to gel like it always does. So my yeah, question is for you also, though. What question? Like I said, I've been monopolizing this. What questions do you have? What topics do you want to you know cover? Yeah, I actually um, I wanted to get your take on something. Um, do you think? I, I know that we you know addressed the offensive line in the draft, but. I also think we got a really good coach in Mark Colombo. I mean, the argument could be made he had Pro Bowl talent in Dallas, but just I feel that our talent that we have on the line currently isn't as bad as maybe us fans perceive it to be. I think Andrew Thomas is a big step above Solder. You know, I think he can hold that left side down. The right side, we're going to have to see how Nate Solder does, but I just want to give you a take. Do you think with the new coaching staff, the new offensive line coaching talent we had that this could be a good to at least average offensive line. And the funny thing is last year, we did not have as bad of a line that most people thought. I mean, if you go most of the, I, I, if anyone watches the channel, they know I'm not a big fan of pro football focus because it's yeah. all subjective and they don't count in for numerous factors. But most of the season we were ranked the 17th offensive line in the league. Um, I think Will Hernandez took a step back. And I think a lot of Nate's problems may have been that it was issues with Will. 
Um, because a lot of times if you, if you miss your assignment, you're hanging your other guy, your other line mate out on an Island, you know, and, mm. and Nate came from a system, you know, in new England. So I think swapping Nate out to the other side is I'm not going to say help resurrect his career, but I think he's going to play a lot better. So I get concerned with putting Thomas and, you know, Hernandez on the same side. I think they could both be bulldozers, but um, you know, and then you take out John Jalapeno, you know, who, who lost it to the Achilles injury and we never intend his contract at center, you know, mm-hmm. we're looking at, you know, you know, bringing in Spencer Pulley, who's, you know, who maybe can handle 16 games. We don't know. And then on the other side of the line, you know, you're talking about bringing in Cam Fleming who out of 70 something games only started 25 and new England mm-hmm. thought so much of him after, you know, after the super bowl that year, after he started through the playoffs in the super bowl, they released him. So, I mean, if he's going to be a backup, I, yeah, I can get that, but I, and I understand your point about coaching, but sometimes we have to look at the exact amount of talent that he has to coach and true. what, what true. pieces that he has. Like I said, a good coach can help a lot, but if you don't have the pieces that gel together, you know, a lot, a lot of times it's just going to be, you know, guys staring at a brick wall and, and, mm-hmm. and an offensive line. I hope they are a brick wall, but like I said, I, I just get, I, I think if the line, if, the, if he can fix the line to a point where we are at the same spot we were last year, if not a little bit better, I think it's going to be fantastic. And I think with his – and like I said, the problem is, as you mentioned before, in Dallas, he had talent. You know, you had all pros in Dallas. You know, you, yeah. you, know, we, you know, we don't have that. We don't have that right now here. But like I said, you never know. I mean, a good coach can go a long way. I think a position coach – is a lot more influential in football than any other sport because they really work with the guys daily. You know, because I've been in the position rooms, so you, you mm-hmm. you've seen how they work with these guys individually, and all they focus on is, you know, what their goal is. So I mean, it's, I mean, I'm I got my fingers crossed. I'll, I'll say that. My thing is, we hired a lot of coaches, and we hired a lot of coaches with head coaching experience but we also hired a lot of coaches with failed head coaching experience. So, you know, and, and the same thing with their coordinator positions, you know, we, we hired a lot of guys that have experience, but they also outside of being with new England, you know, they don't have in Dallas, they don't have the resume of putting it together now, you know, but like I said, it's, I, I am still pumped for the season and I do think a good coach in a long story short, I do think a good coach can go a long way, but I would like to see how our talent gels in the line and see what the lineup is going to be the first couple of weeks of training camp before we can even see what his progress is going to be. And that's, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I think. No, I mean, I think you hit it on the nail. Uh, and I think, you know, we have a young roster and it's getting younger, you know, especially with the players that we drafted. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious, what was your favorite pick in the whole draft that you would say? Andrew you could pick one. Andrew, Andrew Thomas, Thomas does my, if you didn't watch my video, I think I nearly jumped out of the chair when we got it right. Um, we did a video on Andrew Thomas months before the draft. And we actually did a, uh, a video with him, uh, Lamb, the receiver, and I can't remember the other player that we had in the video. And they were the three players that we would like to see the Giants pick. And I, I've mm-hmm. always said, and I've said it for months now, even before I talked to anyone in the league, that I thought Andrew Thomas, just his resume, just his body of work, if you watch his film, was the most pro-ready, you know, offensive lineman in the draft. And I, I, still, feel, I still feel that to this day. And like I said, I was ecstatic. I was always in uh, – and I laugh because I had a back and forth with Bad Dog about this. I was always in the, the Andrew Thomas camp, but I kind of started sliding over to Isaiah Simmons a week before the draft. Not that mm. I wanted them to pick him, but I kind of understood that if they did pick him, you know, we would have something special. And then I was thinking oh, maybe absolutely. we could just grab some linemen later in the draft or maybe trade back up. But like I said, I, I loved the Andrew Thomas pick, and I, I, I got my fingers crossed that he's going to solidify that line for the next 10 years. Absolutely. And to be honest with you, that was my favorite pick too. Uh, you know, I thought – you know, I wanted, uh, if, you look, if you saw my videos, I wanted Wills. I, I thought at that time, nothing wrong with Andrew Thomas or anything like that. I just thought at that time, you know, 
he would be a good fit. You know, he had the ties with Alabama, uh, Joe Judge. So I thought that would be the solid fit. But I feel people forget that, you know, back a couple months ago, the consensus number one tackle was Andrew Thomas. Oh, yeah. Right. You know, and it's, you know, I, I have no problem, you know, with how – they had, excuse me, how they decided to go about picking their offensive tackle. He didn't give up a, I don't think he gave up a single sack last year. No, no, exactly. Uh, in, in Georgia. And he played, he, you know, in, when you play at Alabama, you play some good competition and, you know, you're going to play some good defensive players. I mean, I saw him, though it wasn't last year, I saw him toss Josh Allen. Oh, yeah. Like, like yeah. he was nothing. Like he was nothing. Yep. I remember that. Right yeah. And, and that's the, and like I said, I was, I was a big Josh Allen fan. Uh, going out last year, and like I said, I was a little, I was a little upset when they passed on him. But I remember that, I remember that game with Andrew Thomas. <laughs> so I'm glad you brought that up because maybe you know, maybe I didn't want Josh Allen now when his ten sacks. And Josh, <laughs> you know, he gets, he gets I, more sacks than Yannick Ngagwe and plays a quarter of the time. So I mean, but hey, but everyone, everyone wants Yannick. <laughs> Listen, I, I can't blame them for wanting Yannick, but at the same time, that kind of money that you're going to be paying. For the production you get, eight sacks. I mean, how much were we playing pay Marcus Golden last year? And he gave us more sacks. Yeah, well, now, I'm not saying they're the same player. But. Well, that's the thing, though. But Yannick, most people didn't understand, can't play the run. I mean, he, no, only, he, had can't. 30, he only had 30-something tackles mm-hmm. and like 21 solo. And he had the mm-hmm. one good season. And I kept telling the people, you're going to pay $20 million a year. And that's why Jacksonville is not doing anything with him because nobody wants him. Nobody wants him at his production at $20 million a year. I mean, to the point that I actually heard rumors that he was going to go to Baltimore. And what happened, Kalis Campbell went to Baltimore instead. You know, I, I had the rumor yeah. right, just the wrong guy. But, um, I mean, and so if you're the Ravens and you're trading for a guy in his 30s and passing up a guy that's 25, you know, that, that, uh, that, that, that tells you something about the, you know, about the guy. And then for him to start, you know, for Yannick to start a – Twitter battle with the owner's son. Oh, I mean, that's that's not a good look. And we went through that with Odell. I, I, I'm not going through that again. <laughs> yeah, I, I was um I was having a, a back and forward with one of my subscribers, and I told them I said, look, if you think that they're gonna pick up Yannick now after calling out the owner's son, yeah, it's not. They got rid of Odell, and Odell didn't do anything. Nothing. He didn't do nothing like that. No. He didn't call out the Maras. He didn't, you know, call uh, out Ghetto Maras. Odell signed the contract, and then what? Three days later, he says he doesn't. He's not sure whether he wants to be in New York or not. I mean, yeah, that's, that's I mean, kind of a slap in the face to ownership. Oh, it, 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 you know, when you say it like that, it definitely is. I mean, I guess I'm just comparing it to like me adding, you know, my my boss's son and calling oh, yeah. him a clown on the internet, and in a day and age where Yannick kind of has a spotlight on him because, you know, he, he is a talented player. Oh, yeah. And, you know, he is. You know, he's, he's productive. But, you know, that – and the, uh, he, the owner's son said it himself. That's not going to help his, his uh, trade stock. No. You know, you're going back and forward with me, and I'm trying to figure out how I can trade you, and it's not going to go any faster now. You know, so big, that's going to be a very interesting situation. Big question. You are the Giants' GM. You yes. have Yannick Ngagwe and Javion okay. Clowney sitting both in front of you. You could pick up either one of them on a one-year contract, let's say for $17.5 million. Who are you picking? To be honest with you, I'm going to pick Clowney, only because I feel Clowney can do more. Um, and Clowney isn't – which it's, it's – I'm not going to say that he isn't a headache, but from what I'm seeing from Yannick, as much as the player – that Yannick is, uh, I don't think the Giants are going to go a second round with a headache like that. Uh, they kind of they got that taste uh, with Odell, unfortunately. Um, but I, I'd love to pick up Clowney. You know, the numbers may not be to where Yannick's is, but when you see it on the field, he gets to the quarterback. He's, he's you know, very he, disruptive. Very disruptive. And um, he can play the run, at least in my opinion, better than he can. He actually, he can play the run very well. I actually had a conversation years ago with Steve Spurrier um, about Clowney when he was coming out of college. And he said he was the most athletic player that he had ever coached he, on mm-hmm. either side of the ball. And, he, you know, he thought he was going to tear up the league. Not that he hasn't played well, but he hasn't been, you know, he, he hasn't been that dominant force that, you yeah. know, that everyone thought he was going to be, you know, when he came out of South Carolina. But like mm-hmm. I said, it's a um, 
But on the just on 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 the defensive side, just real quick, Leonard Williams. Leonard yes. Williams signs his tender and then files a grievance the same day because he wants to be tagged as a defensive end instead of a defensive tackle and make the extra 1.8. And I've said it in my video, I do not begrudge any player trying to make as much money as you possibly can. But when you come over and only play eight games and only have 20 something tackles and half a sack, do you really think that extra 1.8 million is something that you deserved or earned? I mean, we're not paying for you what you did on the jets. We, you know, we got to pay you what you think we're going to do for the giants now. So, what is your thought on the Leonard Williams? <laughs> you know, uh, I would never fault another man for doing uh, what he needs to do to get his money. I think we would all try to get that extra bit of money if we were in that position. But this is just my honest opinion. If we didn't sign uh, Leonard Williams to that franchise tag, I'm very curious to see what he felt his market would be when if he were to hit the open market. Because I don't think he's worth even what the franchise tag is giving him. No, he's probably worth like nine, ten million, if, if even that. And that's and I think that would be too much. I mean, Clowney and Ngagwe can't find the team, and nope. you know, and Marcus Golden's still out in the free agent market. I, I don't think Leonard would is going to. I always said I thought Leonard, and I said it back months ago that I always thought if Leonard hit the market, he was going to get a one year prove it deal. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, because. You know, even when he was at uh, with the Jets, I think he had a, he only had one Pro Bowl year. He had seventeen. He had yeah, it was his one Pro Bowl season. You know, and it's I just feel I'm not going to call him a bust because he's not a terrible player, but just he's not worth that money. You know, I I feel like if we didn't if we didn't trade for him, he wouldn't be on the team. You mean you mean you're not turned on by the almost sack that he always gets the the instant <laughs> value? I always hear that Leonard Williams offers the the hidden value. And I always love that guy. Oh, he's got hidden value. I'm tired. I don't want a guy. And I said it before, I don't want a guy with hidden value. I want a guy that's a pro bowler. You know, I, absolutely. And absolutely. Then we did a bunch of videos where if you broke down his eight games, the first eight games with Adam, we averaged, we gave up four yards a carry on defense. Mm. With him, we gave up 3.5. And if you Ooh, broke down the total, we were only a negative three yard difference with him on the field than with him not on the field. So I said, is that really yeah. going to be worth $17.8 million? I, no, I, it absolutely isn't. And I'll be honest with you. I, I got heat for saying this. Maybe I need some new contacts. I don't know. <laughs> I personally didn't see that big of a difference from when we signed them to when we didn't have them. Thank you. Thank you. I feel if, – if, I'll be honest with you. If, if, Gabe, if uh, Dave Gettleman would have took that third and five and would have traded it for a – Let's say it was a tackle, or let's say it was maybe a different position than because I thought our, our 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 at least on the defensive side the run game wasn't bad. No, it, it wasn't before he got there. It, yeah, it improved slightly, but it wasn't enough for me to be like that's what, the guy that was we that sign. improvement. Dexter Lawrence coming together as a player, Dalvin Tomlinson having a good season. I mean, I think it was Dexter Lawrence, and I actually um I met Dexter Lawrence uh, back at the Super Bowl. Um, I actually, I have some weird ties with the Giants. It's uh, we could always get to that, you know, in another video or after the video. Uh, but I got to meet Dexter Lawrence uh, when he gave me and my family Super Bowl tickets, um, and he's just such a massive, he's a massive guy. guy. Yeah. And I walked him. I, I saw him walk through the door on a boat, and he had to go sideways yeah, to see. get through that door. And I, met, I met him at training camp. Yeah, he, he, is, he, is a, he is a large man. <laughs> Huge. So, you know, with me bringing that up, I really feel that, you know, it was the players around Leonard Williams. You know, I, I didn't notice anything too crazy with Leonard Williams. And at this point, you kind of have to tag him because you traded for him. Right. Well, you can't have Gettleman you know? make the mistake, but then you got people, and we did a video about it too, you know, you still had people like, you know, Zach Bond, you know, sitting there yeah. when, we, when we could have that pick. Lloyd Cushenberry, you know, was still mm -hmm. there at our original pick. I mean, there, there were players that, you know, maybe we're talking about the potential players, you know, mm -hmm. that could have the talent. But like I said, I, 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 don't, I, I understand Gellman's point. You know, you trade a three and a five, you, you're not going to dump the guy. But it's one of those yeah. things. I mean, you got to think about it. You know, in the long they run, they may dump him next year. Yeah, well, I, t I always they, said he's gonna be he's gonna be one and done. 
and, and, I, and I still believe that. But uh, what we're going to do right now is, you know, we are going to close this out, and we're going to sit here with the Brooklyn Hit Squad 96. Mr. Hit Squad, I want you to take this last minute or so and just give us your final take. It could be on anything. It could be on the end of the season. Anything you want to let's, – let's, let's end the show on a high note. Definitely. Uh, to be honest with you, I think, we, like I said earlier, we're headed in the right direction. Um, I think, you know, Joe Judge and Dave Gettleman, they have a plan. You know, they, Dave Gettleman's been saying he has a plan. Maybe this is the plan. <laughs> Who knows? But, um, you know, I think that we're going to be a lot better than people think that we're going to be. Even, even us as fans feel that we're going to be. I see some people saying we're going to be a six-win team because of the schedule. I personally had us going eight and eight. You have us going nine and seven. So um, I think that we're going to be a lot better than we think. I think it's, it's really good that they're trying to build a culture in this organization, which is something that we have not had in years, yep. probably since the Super Bowl times. We haven't had a culture. And uh, it, it's, it's really refreshing. I think this is all a breath of fresh air. It's ref- I, I said this in one of my videos. It's refreshing to see and hear that the Giants are making smart decisions because they haven't been making smart decisions in recent years, um, in my honest opinion. Um, but I, I think we, we as fans have a lot to look forward to. You know, we have a lot to look forward to in, uh, in the upcoming years, uh, especially with Mr. Barkley and uh, Daniel Jones. You put know, it all, I, put it I, all I, together. I, absolutely. I think, you know, if Saquon's been able to do what he's been able to do behind this piss-poor offensive line that we've given him, if this can be a better offensive line and more solidified, man, who knows? We are going to go all – we're not going to go all the way, but like I said, we are going to the playoffs. And, again, this is Tim with Online Big Blue with Brooklyn Hit Squad 96. We are bringing to it all. We are going to put Mr. Hit Squad's – Link to his YouTube page right below us, right above us. Go on there, like, subscribe, ring the bell, do all those fun things. And again, this is Tim with Online Big Blue, bringing you the best in New York Giants like talking entertainment. And as always, thanks for watching. Thank you.